worshiper, lover of living, ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come, 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 whoever you are, condemn, come, are welcome here. No matter your religious beliefs or lack of belief, you are welcome here. No matter your age, sex, sexual orientation or gender identity, you are welcome here. No importa tu ciudadanía, tu estás bienvenido aquí. No matter your citizenship, politics, or relationship status. No matter your physical characteristics or health, you are welcome here. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, you are welcome in this place. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Montgomery Online Worship for June 14, 2020. My name is Lynn Hopkins, and it is my honor to serve this congregation as its minister. I'd like to invite you into this hour of worship with these words from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. In the final analysis, love is not this sentimental something we talk about. It is not merely an emotional something. Love is creative, understanding goodwill for all. It is the refusal to defeat any individual. When you rise to the level of love, of its great beauty and power, you seek only to defeat evil systems. Individuals who happen to be caught up in that system, you love, but you seek to defeat the system. We now welcome Roger Burdett to share with us the final chapter of the book that we have been enjoying for so many months. It is a time for all ages. Hello and welcome to Time for All Ages. And here we are, the final episode of our reading of Loser, Why Fit In When You Can Stand Out by Jerry Spinelli. I am taping at the Tallapoosa River for no symbolic reason. I just wanted to go someplace different. I'm in Wetumpka. I have to say that we are reading this book with permission from Harper Collins Children's Books, but also with permission from Jerry Spinelli. I asked him if he would send us a video greeting he declined that invitation, but he did send me an email with a, a greeting, and this is for us, to the kids, he says. Greetings from Pennsylvania, which is where I imagine Loser, like a lot of my stories, taking place. Loser is, you might say, a fictional spinoff of a talk that I've given many times about the value of losing and failure and that it's the participation and effort that counts, and that the only way to reach success 
on the other side of the creek is over the stepping stones of your failures. The novel is called Loser only because that's what Zinkoff is called. Actually, he's the biggest winner in the story, just not in the ways that we usually and too often measure success. Jerry Spinelli. So, thank you to him for that greeting. So let's finish this story. each chosen seven kids and the kid with the hat, he's a leftover. But this kid doesn't act like a leftover. A normal leftover would see that he's one too many, that everybody but him has been picked and he must be pretty hopeless. And therefore he better just get on out of there and go play something he's good at like Monopoly. But this kid just stands there. He shows no signs of turning and vanishing. And he's not just standing there, he is staring, staring at Tuttle and Bonts. So one of the things I have loved, there's a lot that I love about this character, Zinkoff. But dude, he, he doesn't give up. And so here we are at the end of the story, staring at these two captains expectantly. We got enough, says Tuttle. So now the kid, he's just staring at Bonts. And Bonts wants to say, we got enough. But he can't seem to say it. He, he wishes the kid would just turn and go away. Doesn't he know he's a leftover? Jansky, another kid, speaks up. The sides are even. We don't need nobody else. But the kid doesn't take the hint. He just stares at Bonds. This is uncharted territory. A leftover who, who won't go away. But still, Bonds holds the power. All he has to do is open his mouth. Please go, he thinks. But he doesn't say it, and the kid is still staring right at him. The kid really is stupid. The kid doesn't know that even if he's allowed in, he's only going to be ignored or embarrassed or hurt. He doesn't know that he is a klutz. Doesn't he know that he's out of his league? And I am turning to the final page. He's supposed to wish he could disappear because that's what he is. He is a leftover. He is the last kid. But this kid, Donald Zinka. He won't back off. And yes, I'm getting a little bit emotional. Woo! I'm all for the underdogs. And Zinkoff is an underdog. But this kid won't back off. And his stare is hitting Bonts like a football in the forehead. That's ironic, isn't it? Because earlier, Bonts had thrown this really hard spiral and hit Zinkoff. But now Zinkoff is staring at him and his, his gaze is getting to Bonts. Bonts sees something that he doesn't understand. It occurs to him that he wants to ask that kid what it was like those seven hours. He wants to ask the kid what it was like being that cold. This is goofy, Bonts thinks. He thinks of a thousand things to say, a thousand other ways that this could go, but in the end, there's really only one word, and he knows that. One word from him, and who knows where we go from there. Last two sentences. So he points at the kid who's never been selected for a team, and he says, I'm sorry, zinc off. And the game begins. The end. Who knows how the game is going to go? But and the game begins just opens up a whole new life. 
Have a really good week. <laughs>
But most men and most women never discover it, for they believe in hitting for hitting. They believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. They believe in hating for hating. But Jesus comes to us and says, this isn't the way. And this morning, as I think of the fact that our world is in transition now, our whole world is facing a revolution. Our nation is facing a revolution. Our nation, one of the things that concerns me most is that in the midst of the revolution of the world and the midst of the revolution of this nation, that we will discover the meaning of Jesus' words. History, unfortunately, leaves some people oppressed and some people oppressors. And there are three ways that individuals who are oppressed can deal with their oppression. One of them is to rise up against their oppressors with physical violence and corroding hatred. But, oh, this isn't the way. For the danger and the weakness of this method is its futility. Violence creates many more social problems than it solves. And I've, as I've said in so many instances, that the Negro in particular and colored peoples all over the world struggle for freedom if they succumb to the temptation of using violence in their struggle Unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness, and our chief legacy to the future will be an endless reign of meaningless chaos. Violence isn't the way. Another way is to acquiesce and give in to resign yourself to the oppression. Some people do that. They discover the difficulties of the wilderness moving into the promised land, and they would rather go back to the despots of Egypt because it's difficult to get into the promised land. And so they resign themselves to the fate of oppression. They somehow acquiesce to this thing, but that too isn't the way because non-cooperation with evil is as much moral obligation as it is as is cooperation with good. But there is another way, and that is to organize mass nonviolent resistance based on the principle of love. And it seems to me this is the only way as our eyes look into the future. As we look out across the years and across the generations, let us develop and move right here. We must discover the power of love the power, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. We will be able to make men better. Love is the only way. The words of the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr.
I struggled right up to the last minute as to whether to use that song. In some respects, it feels too upbeat for what I want to talk about. But I do want to communicate the sense of hope, of positive energy that is rising up. And I enjoy the imagery of an irrepressible song, something in the midst of all the chaos and storms around us that rises up from within, a resilient core that simply insists on hope and joy and love. But some of those verses really feel a little off to me right now. I mean, quote, No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Really? If no storm can shake your inmost calm right now, you aren't paying attention. Now, I get the sentiment, and I embrace the sentiment, if we can hold on to the truth at the center of our consciousness, to remain always aware and mindful of that truth, we'll get through this intact. And what is that truth? The next line of the lyric, since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Love is Lord? What does that mean? I'm not sure exactly what the lyricist intended, but I really don't think it's meant to mean anything exactly. Just love. Love is all, everything. When the Unitarian prophet Theodore Parker described the nature of authentic religion, he identified love as what is permanent, even as everything else might pass away. 
We talk about love a lot. And it's reasonably easy to pledge ourselves to love as long as we are just around each other, right? But it's another thing altogether when we see the ice-cold face of Derek Chauvin as he murders a man right in front of our eyes. You don't expect me to love people like that, do you? Well, The teaching on which King's words are based come from Jesus, who is known to have said this, love your enemies. I know. But surely love your enemies doesn't apply when the enemy is one who would literally annihilate all their enemies, including me and a lot of people I love if they had their way. Well, the prophet Jesus of Nazareth experienced exactly that. He was according to the story, tortured and brutally executed by those he chose to love. And likewise, more recently, Dr. King, tormented day and night, and ultimately murdered by people that he chose to love. So maybe they knew what they were talking about. At times like this, it's hard to be sure of anything. And Dr. King in his teachings sets an unattainably high standard. At least for most of us. So, if the recent violence, the cruel, unnecessary, and deadly acts of a handful of police officers in various places across the country feel in some way like they are directed toward you, you may be not sure that Dr. King's message is the best or wisest course. I can't judge for you. For me, though, this is my aim. And you know what? Even if it isn't the smartest or most effective, I am completely certain that it is the truest the truest to my own spirit and the truest to the spirit of life that I hope to affirm and promote in all I do. Um, it bears noting that the first principle, the one we often quote, the one that says we gotta love even those dogs, The first principle doesn't actually say love. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. In fact, if you keep reading, not one of the principles contain that word. When I first realized that, it, it struck me as quite odd. But then I realized that what the principles do for me is help me to understand the ways in which I live out what is true for me. And they help me understand how we, each of us and all of us together, can walk in a way that 
honors and reveres the ultimacy of love. The redemptive, transformative, life-giving power of love. The first principle sets the premise necessary to love all the human beings however we find them. The inherent worth and dignity of every person. It's not a scientific fact. I can't prove it. It's a faith claim. It is what I choose to believe is true despite all evidence to the contrary because there is enough in my own life that affirms it. It is what I choose to believe is true because it is the underpinning of my faith practice. It is where and how I find meaning in a life that can be challenging, perplexing, bewildering, chaotic. The inherent worth and dignity of every person asserts that this is inseparable, inviolable, indestructible. Inherent. No matter what somebody does. Inherent. I cling. And sometimes it's the only thing that makes this life among human beings tolerable. The first principle informs me that there aren't good people and bad people. There are people of inherent worth and dignity. And yes, they can do some harmful, horrible things, and they can do some amazing, generous, life-giving things. And sometimes it's the same ones. Most people, pretty much everybody I've encountered in my life, do both. But the harmful things still do not invalidate the first and most important thing that I know. The inherent worth and dignity of every person And if that is true, the only response, the only possible response is love. And people ask me about it all the time. So what do you mean when you tell us to love these people who are beating on us and bombing our houses and kicking our children around? What in the world do you mean when you say love such people? And I always have to stop and try to define the meaning of love in this area. And interestingly enough, Greek philosophy comes to our aid at this point. There are three words in the Greek language for love. One of them is the word eros. Now eros is a sort of aesthetic love. Uh, the philosopher Plato talks about it a great deal in his dialogues, the yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. It has come to us to mean a sort of romantic love, and so we all know about Eros. We've experienced it. We've read about it in the beauties of literature. In a sense, Edgar Allan Poe was talking about Eros when he talked about his beautiful Annabelle Lee with a love surrounded by the halo of eternity. In a sense, Shakespeare was talking about Eros when he said, Love is not love, which alters when its alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It is an ever-fixed mark 
that looks on Tempest and is never shaken. It is a star to every wandering bark. You know, I can remember that because I used to quote it to my wife when we were coding. That's error. That's error. Then the Greek language talks about phileo, which is another level of love. It is an intimate affection between personal friends. On this level, we love because we are loved. We love people that we like. This is friendship. Then the Greek language has another word called agape. Agape is more than romantic love. Agape is more than friendship. Agape is not something affectionate. Agape is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Theologians would say that it is the love of God operating in the human heart. And when one rises to love on this level, he loves men not because he likes them, but he loves every man because God loves him. He goes on with that. And so he rises to the level of hating the system rather than the individual who is caught up in that system. He loves the person and hates the evil deed. And I think this is what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. And I'm happy that he didn't say like your enemies because it's pretty difficult to like some people. It's difficult to like people bombing your home and threatening your children and kicking you about. But Jesus says, love them, and love is greater than like. Love is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. I hope you'll join us for second hour. This week we're going to have a discussion after the service on Zoom. You can find the link to that on our webpage, the front of our website in the bright yellow banner at uumontgomery.org. Join us for that discussion. Join us on Wednesday evening for our You, You, and You, which starts at 6.30, and um, it's just a few of us on Zoom talking about um, the core, the elements of Unitarian Universalism. Coming up soon is our annual meeting, the last Sunday of this month, if you are a member with an email address on file, you should have received an email yesterday. If you didn't and you think you should have, please let me know. Uh, if you do not have an email on file with us, uh, the U.S. mail went out the notification for the annual meeting, so you should be receiving that uh, in a day or two. I urge everyone to come to the annual meeting, even if you're not a member, um, or if you're a member but not yet eligible to vote, come check it out, see what it's all about. The business of what we do shouldn't be too painful and could be quite enlightening. And it helps us to get to know who you are, and it certainly would help for you to get to know who all we are And so for now, our service has ended. May our service begin.